Today's presenters are LucidWorks CTO and Solar Committer Grant Ingersoll and LucidWorks Senior Engineer and Solar Committer Tim Potter. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Thanks, Aaliyah. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us. Before we get started, I just want to throw out there that if, if this kind of stuff is interesting to you, we've got a whole conference committed to this kind of uh, knowledge and, and sharing and community. It's called Lucene Solar Revolution. It's in October in Boston. The link there should be on your screen, so we would love to have you all join us there as well, where you can go much deeper than we can ever cover in one hour in a one-hour webinar. So with that, as Elias said, my name is Grant Ingersoll. I've also got with me uh, Tim Potter, and we're going to take you through some of the new capabilities in Solar Six around SQL, parallel streaming, and graph capabilities. As we get into that, you'll see what we're going to try to do here is I'm going to cover some of the motivations as well as Tim, and then Tim's going to jump in and go through the base core capabilities around streaming expressions and what the SQL capabilities in Solar are as of today. I'm going to then jump in and show how this graph stuff fits into all of those capabilities. And then we'll finish up with a few comparisons to some other engines that you might be interested in, things like Hive and Drill and Impala and Elasticsearch and uh, Spark and so on. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the future direction and then finish up with questions. So as we get started, I just want to put out there what we try to do when we think about search here at LucidWorks and how we make contributions to both solar and fusion. We like to think about how do we enable search to drive more, the, the ability to answer more interesting questions, harder questions. How can we simplify the architecture that people have by adding more capabilities into something they already know and trust like solar? And so at the end of the day, when we think about search, we think about let's make everything be search driven because as it turns out, the algorithms and data structures that are a core part of Lucene and solar make it incredibly easy to answer lots of different questions. And I think you'll see today with the addition of some of these streaming capabilities and these graph capabilities, that you're going to be able to answer even more questions than what you traditionally thought were answerable in a search engine. So with that, I'll jump over to Tim and he can delve into that a little bit deeper. Sure. So, you know, when uh, Grant proposed I help him out on this talk, uh, the first thing I wanted to kind of answer is, you know, why does solar, this search engine, need parallel computation? And, Really one of the first things that uh, kind of struck me um, that I see out with our customers and that actually myself as a big data practitioner at a previous job was that in order to satisfy a number of different uh, access patterns for your data, uh, th these big data systems tend to get very complex. Um, and for example, you know, you, you may need for particular use cases to do primary key lookups, right? And that's where you use something like a, HBase or Cassandra, actually Solar is quite good at doing uh, fast key lookups. Uh, there's all obviously um, <clears throat> low latency ranked retrieval type queries that are at the heart of Solar are, are very important, especially in big data. And then also there's, you know, times where you need to look at a broader uh, scope of your data, right, to do deep analytics or drive some machine learning algorithm or what have you. And that's where you see sort of large table scans looking at millions of rows at a time to do, to do various group buys and relational type analyses. And then also uh, pertinent to what we talked today, more and more we see people wanting to explore the, the link structure in data using graph algorithms and things like that. And traditionally, these are all different access patterns that particular systems, one or another, is very good at. But then when you try to essentially overlay uh, low latency, ranked retrieval type searches, uh, when you also need to do sort of large table scans, that's where it broke down and you start to see, you know, sort of complexity creep into your architecture and things like that. And so one of the things that really excites me about solar having a parallel computation engine is that actually, uh, and you know, this is a bold statement, but uh, it's the reason I'm pretty excited about this is that uh, solar 
can actually handle all of these types of access patterns in a very robust manner now with this engine we're going to present today. Um, and the other thing is, you know, is not, not a, such a bold statement, but, you know, as most of the people on the call that have worked with solar have experienced, you know, the need to denormalize, to fit a relational type data uh, set into solar and have, uh, you know, performant queries, that denormalization problem uh, can be very, very inconvenient and, again, add a lot of complexity. And so uh, what we'll see today is actually those, the, that, that demand for, normalize, for denormalizing in solar, though that's sort of breaking down and we're going to have some better options. And the other thing is, um, to me, it doesn't really make sense to have a parallel computation engine if the engine itself can't scale. Uh, and by scale, I mean horizontally, you can take advantage you know, of more and more nodes and, and distributed type clusters. Uh, and so, you know, it, over the last several years while I've worked at LucidWorks, one of my main focus has been, you know, helping the solar community scale out. And so, to me, basically building this parallel computation on a very scalable and stable technology in solar, you know, this is the right time to do that. And then lastly, and I think this goes without saying, but I always like to mention it, is that um, when it comes to analyzing data, you just can't beat speed. Right? And, and I think it goes without saying that solar is extremely fast, and, and the way it answers queries is very fast. And so, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to have an analytical query take three minutes, but if, you, if that can come back in sub-second or in a few seconds, that's a, that's a huge win for, you, for all users. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is one of the things that uh, uh, feeds into how we go about building Fusion is we want to make sure we have the capabilities necessary to deliver the answers in the right way at the right time. For those who aren't familiar with Fusion, just real quick, uh, this I like to call it Solar Plus Plus. At the end of the day, Fusion is built on three core principles, and, you know, after this we'll get into what the capabilities are here in solar, but I want to at least highlight how we leverage these things in Fusion real quick. If you're not familiar with Fusion, like I said, we're trying to build out on three core principles. We want to drive next generation relevance by taking advantage of not only the content, which is what traditionally search engines have been focused on, but also bring in signals, collaboration, context, where, is, where are people located, what are they doing, all of those things, mash them together and drive next generation relevance. Second, and what, you know, what's really important at the end of the day here is we build out on top of best-in-class open source. So all of that knowledge you have on the web from Solar and Spark, et cetera, can be leveraged when using Fusion. And then last but not least, we want to simplify application development and really reduce the ongoing maintenance. We've seen time and time again where people building search applications save a lot of time and money by starting with Fusion as opposed to trying to work out all of the different pieces themselves. So at the end of the day, what does all of this stuff look like and why is solar streaming and, and its relationship to Spark uh, and all this graph capability so important to us? Because as you can see here in our architecture, this right-hand side, Spark, Solar, Zookeeper, those are really the core bits of Fusion. Solar is, is effectively our database. We put anything and everything we need to store in solar. We then use Spark for offline large-scale distributed computation. And so you might be asking yourself, well, how does that compare with what uh, solar does in terms of distributed computation, like what Tim was alluding to? And uh, rest assured, we'll, we'll cover those things today as we dive into the, these specific features. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Tim, and he's going to jump in and, and lay the groundwork around the streaming expressions and, and SQL, and then I'll dive in on the graph. Great. Thanks, Grant. Okay, so kind of to get started, I wanted to really explore this question of, you know, why are we putting SQL into solar and the search engine and all that? And I think it, it really boils down to a couple key things for me. And the first is, and I don't really have to tell you this, but SQL is the ubiquitous language for analytics. Um, it's been around for many years and is just basically has the tooling. And um, even more importantly these days, um, you know, uh, there's plenty of articles out there telling us, you know, the, the shortage of data scientists and data engineers and organizations are struggle for that analytical talent. And while um, SQL skills 
and data science aren't the same thing. Um, I, I actually really believe that if you empower normal business analysts that, that you know, have grown up using SQL uh, to do a lot of their own analysis, that frees up the data engineers and the data scientists' time. So to me, basically having a SQL uh, interface to solar really makes it so that more people can actually access this power in solar. You know, and the other thing is just, and as I mentioned, the, the, the tooling out there around SQL uh, is vastly more abundant than it is around solar, right? And, and, and you know, proprietary type query languages, things like that. Um, I, I always make the joke, I can walk around and pretty much ask anybody in the company to write me a SQL query and, and they'll probably get it done in a few minutes. But I ask them to write me a distributed solar pivot facet query, it'll probably take them a while. And we're, you know, we're actually uh, the people that, that are, are mostly behind solar. So that, there's something to that. <clears throat> And then the other one, and this is a little bit more technical and subtle to grasp, but um, when, once we have SQL support in solar, that's when the core guys, such as myself and Grant um, and, and, you know, the rest of the actual solar committer, committers out there can actually kind of dig in and work on things like the, you know, optimizing the query planner in solar so that joins are more efficient, you know, when I should do a hash join and those type of things. So what it really does is it, is it separates the interface from the actual, you know, the engine and the, the uh, you know, the optimization of those queries. And so uh, for me, the, the having SQL as a way to access solar uh, really opens up solar to a, just a whole new class of users. <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's get started because I think, you know, obviously this isn't going to be a SQL tutorial but I actually think this is useful to kind of get some of the nom nomenclature in place. Um, so really, um, the, the data set throughout these slides we're going to be working with is the Movie Lens data set. If you're not familiar with that, uh, it's an open source data set that uh, essentially has movie ratings uh, from users. And so, you know, one of the common type things are, you know, give me the top five action movies, you know, with rating four or better. And if you think about it, Solar has had relational and, and SQL type constructs for a very long time uh, in its fastening engine, right? Um, and, and the reason for that is, is not because um, <clears throat> of anything special. It's just people want to ask relational type questions about their data. And so there you can see essentially the solar syntax of sending a query, you know, to filter on the genre of action and my ratings is a range query. And then I do some faceting on uh, on the movie, in this case title, and what comes back is a bit of JSON that you then have to deal with. <clears throat> on the bottom there is actually the same query in solar, and as I said on the, on the previous slide, I really think most people can kind of grok what that uh, SQL statement is doing there very, very quickly, just because we've all sort of grown up with SQL. And then on the right, you can see that unlike the result sets that come back from a normal SQL query, the engine behind, which is this streaming engine that I'll talk about in more depth um, in a few slides, it returns essentially the, the core data structure of, of databases, which is the tuple, right? And so we essentially uh, now have the, you know, the, uh, the same results, but coming back from SQL, uh, very similar to the same ideas as faceting, um, but in, the, in now using SQL to interact with Solar. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to show a couple more SQL examples because I think uh, it's useful for you to see sort of some of the features that are currently implemented in Solar. So if we take the top query right there, I'm essentially, you know, asking, give me the average rating for men and women, you know, over the age of 30 uh, for romance movies. Uh, and this is actually an interesting query because uh, there isn't as big of a gap in there as you might think um, based on uh, demographic biases. But uh, uh, essentially that query is handled by solar. The only little weirdness that you might notice there is actually the age uh, clause in there is, is still using solar's range syntax. And that's one of the limitations that I'll talk about. But other than that, that is just, you know, basic SQL using a group by, right, on the gender and then doing some aggregation, in this case, account and, and an average. The, the middle query there is, you know, give me, again, top five. That's um, 
uh, you know, that should tell you essentially that we're going to be doing some grouping, right, um, for movies rated that, you know, have at least 100 ratings, right? So same basic concept here that we're essentially doing a group by and, uh, and some sorting and some filtering. Again, all these translate into uh, queries back down into the solar engine uh, on the back end, but at the front end, you really don't know you're working with solar here. And then the last one there is actually interesting because I'm, I'm saying, you know, give me the set of users, the unique set of users, the distinct um, that have rated documentaries. You know, these people are really into documentaries or whatever. And again, that sort of speaks to this idea that, that we're actually pulling out, you know, distinct sets. And behind the scenes, and this is where I'll get into the, the you know, the implementation details is that we're actually using, you know, a, a form of like a MapReduce type engine in solar. All right, a little delay there. Okay, yeah, okay. So <clears throat> now we've kind of seen some of the queries, the SQL queries uh, that solar is capable of executing now. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, on the back end, how they're executed. And, and that's where this idea of streaming expressions and the streaming engine under solar, or it's also kind of called the parallel computation engine. And so what happens is that we essentially have kind of two main concepts in this parallel computation. You have stream sources, and that is essentially, you know, uh, what is generating the tuples to then be, you know, operated on. And the most obvious one there is, search, right? I want to actually execute some search against the solar engine, get those results, stream them through my MapReduce engine to then do maybe a roll-up or an average, as we saw, or calculate a distinct set, those type of things. There are also, and, get, and Grant will go in more detail, uh, there's, a, there's a stream source for, for doing graph type uh, things, which is that gather nodes. And there's also the ability to pull in data from a JDBC data source there's as well as like a topic and things like that, which we won't have time to get into today. Then on top of a source, now that you have this stream of tuples flowing through the engine, you can do various operations and you can compose these into very complex um, operations that, that, you know, mostly are around relational type algebra. So, you know, complements, you can do joins. I'll give an example of a hash join here in a second. Um, that, and, you know, there's all these different type of, what we call stream decorators that essentially can be composed to do very powerful things and operate on this stream. Okay, so <clears throat> begin. So the streaming API is essentially sits up on top of solar. It's built in essentially, um, if you're aware of kind of the internal nomenclature of solar, there, there's under the hood, there's a stream request handler, and on top of that, there's actually the SQL handler, which handles uh, a lot of the, the, the SQL interface that's built on top of streaming. And uh, the stream engine works on fields that have what's called doc values enabled. And doc values are essentially um, a column-oriented view of the stored values in a field. Right, so uh, rather than a row-oriented view, which is actually very expensive to go and kind of unpack and analyze, a column-oriented view allows you to basically scan the, uh, you know, all the values for a particular field across all documents very, very efficiently. Right, and so that's very similar to kind of column-oriented stores like Cassandra and whatnot. So um, the idea here is that you have doc values enabled for you know either all of your fields. Um, or a subset, and typically you uh, and you actually can't have doc values for text fields, right? That you would do sort of full text search on. But think of doc values as being applicable for more structured data: dates, you know, um, numeric fields, boolean fields, uh, string fields that aren't text analyzed, and that sort of thing. Okay, so you have essentially this set of fields that have doc values enabled that allows you to now. Um, access them in this column oriented way so you can you know you can do aggregations and rollups and things like that so <clears throat> in our analysis uh, reading fields with doc values enabled through this streaming infra infrastructure can actually be 
eight to ten times faster than actually pulling the data out through the query interface, right? So uh, now with, that's even using cursor mark and distributed deep paging and all those things. Uh, using the streaming engine is typically eight to ten times faster pulling data out of solar. So it really is very fast and scalable. <clears throat> I'll get into this do it, get into this in an, another slide, but there are different ways of accessing uh, the data and doing aggregations, right? Because um, if, you, if you're thinking to yourself, well, solar has this faceting engine. It actually has several. It also has stats, uh, component, and things like that. So solar is very well capable of doing aggregations itself in the engine. And so the streaming API doesn't go off and reproduce that. It actually works quite well with the built-in aggregation hooks in solar. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, the, the key thing to this slide, and I think you take one thing away about the streaming API at this point, is that it essentially has an architecture that uses uh, different tiers, right? And I've already kind of talked about the SQL tier, and that, that's not as interesting because, you know, it just basically implements a SQL parser and query planner and that type of thing. Going the next level down is this worker tier, right? And this is very interesting because Unlike a query, which when you execute a distributed query in solar, you, you effectively pick one replica from each shard to query and get the data from. The worker tier in the streaming data actually can pull data, um, partitions of your data from each replica. So the scale here, the scale possibilities is much greater. You just add more replicas and each one of those actually participates in processing the stream. And we use under the cover something called the hash Q parser, right? And it essentially calculates partitions into the, the doc set in a shard so that you can essentially send um, queries, processing requests to all replicas in parallel, right? And read. So the actual scalability of stream processing in solar using these workers is, is, you know, you're basically being able to use all your computing power in solar. Now, I've actually seen on the mailing list cases where people have overdone the workers and you actually get, you know, too much load on your server. So that's something you have to watch out for. But I would kind of assert that's a very good problem to have. And then lastly, of course, there's the data tier, right? The solar, the underlying solar collection. And I think the key there is, right, you just, you just design your collections as you, as you normally would, all using all the different techniques of, of planning your collection layout. And the key here is that you can actually lay out the workers differently uh, than you do your data collection. So this streaming aggregation framework allows you to essentially scale out your workers differently than the data, right? Because, uh, you know, think of the opposite. What if, what if you had to have 50 shards to get the kind of streaming computation uh, you wanted without workers? People don't want to always set up their collection with 50 shards. It just, it, you know, if the data doesn't warrant it, then it's not necessary. So think that you can actually scale and control uh, how many workers versus the actual data tier separately with this architecture. Okay, so. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about the SQL interface. Under the covers, the SQL interface actually just translates into what are called streaming expressions. And this is an example of a streaming expression that performs a hash join. So for those that aren't familiar or forgot their database class, a hash join is essentially you're really joining um, typically a large data set with a small one. And this, in my example here, um, I'm, I'm gonna join movie ratings, which Obviously, there are, you know, um, orders of magnitude potentially more ratings for movies than there are movies in the world, right? So we have this typical large data being joined with small data, right? So the, the hash here is the right-hand side, which will be my movie metadata, right? And then the large table, the left-hand side, is the movie ratings, right? And it's kind of contrived, but as you can see, I'm doing this hash join, <clears throat> And Solar uh, essentially is using this streaming expression language for you to co uh, communicate. And the details here, obviously, we don't have time to go through, um, but I'll, I'll kind of call out a couple of things that are interesting. So effectively, when you do this hash join, 
the small table in this in this case the movies actually gets pulled into memory on it on each worker right so now all that data is stored in memory so that you can effectively very quickly join it with the large table which is not stored in memory because it's too big right um, and the other thing is that I'm actually using this wrapper and this shows a good example of how uh, the streaming expressions Remember those decorators that I mentioned, the stream decorators, essentially are composable into more complex, um, into more complex operations. And what I'm doing here is I'm essentially parallelizing this join across four workers. Right? And that's really how you can essentially um, uh, do very, very fast joins in solar is by using this par parallel operation around your, around your, 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 your inner stream decorator, which, are, you know, in this case is a hash join, but it could be an inner join, a left outer join, whatever. Next slide. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> okay. So one of the key things, and I think about these big data systems, uh, I work a lot with Spark, is this idea that um, we want to push down into the engine itself you know, as much as possible, okay? And the idea there is, uh, for example, if I was working with Spark and uh, Spark does joins, we could stream all the data out of solar, billions of rows, and do the join in Spark. That's great, but that's very inefficient. Or even simpler, if I want to calculate an average of a field, well, solar can do that for you very efficiently in the engine. So the idea is that you want to be able to push down the computation as low down into the engine as possible. And so solar streaming API supports this concept of aggregation modes, right? And the first one is sort of the MapReduce aggregation mode. And the idea there is it's very much like MapReduce in that uh, there's a shuffle phase and, you know, the docs with the or tuples with the same keys get shuffled to the right worker and that sort of thing. And that's really good for sort of high cardinality type aggregations. Um, in this example here, you can see I'm essentially doing a group by user ID. As I mentioned, we have a heck of a lot more users than we do movies. At least we hope we do. Um, and, and then there's also this facet aggregation mode, which will push the aggregations down into Solar's faceting engine, which, as we all know, is world class. So um, the idea there is if you have sort of a low to moderate cardinality, Right, because faceting is very memory intensive, that you can actually push those aggregation questions down into the facet engine. And uh, this is where you can get really, really low latency. So the MapReduce thing allows you to have very large data sets and do group buys on that or distincts on that, um, but it's uh, essentially it's not as fast as faceting. So these are two modes you want to experiment with, and it really will require you kind of doing some experimentation and testing with your own data, but you should know that the options are there. <clears throat> and then lastly, before I turn it over to Grant um, and take all of his time, is that I basically uh, wanted to kind of say, you know, how do we use all this infusion? And I think it's quite interesting. Um, for, the, for the most part, we rely on the streaming engine to actually pull out um, signal data, right? And this is clicks, ratings, whatever, signal data uh, around search, you know, interacting with the search engine to then compute recommendations and boost. And so we use that from the Spark side to do a lot of the kind of complex aggregations and SQL and whatnot, but we actually pull the data out using the streaming API. Um, and then we also offer ways to actually kind of, you know, write your own Scala job in Fusion and have it run as a custom job in the background to do whatever complex things you can think of. And then also, you know, at the end of the day, your data is only good as, you know, what you can kind of visualize. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, you know, and I would add on here, too, I mean, I think one of the ways I think about it anyways is that I, I want to use Spark for those large-scale iterative style jobs and I want to use solar when I want the answer right now. Like I know I can get this answer as fast as possible. I can stream out the results and, and be on my way. Whereas some, some algorithms, some applications, some things that you want to do often require an iterative approach. And so uh, solar doesn't yet support that. Uh, and Spark obviously has a lot of constructs around those kinds of things. And in fact, was you know, kind of purposely built for those large scale iterative jobs. 
So with that, uh, thanks to Tim for the, the intro on the streaming stuff. As, as you'll see here in a minute with the graph, you'll see that some of this graph stuff actually fits into the streaming capabilities as well. So uh, graph here, uh, we're talking obviously about things like social network graphs and, and relationships between nodes and edges and not, you know, graphs as in your uh, grade school uh, drawing, uh, drawings and, and charts and all of those things. So. Uh, if you're not familiar with graphs, uh, there's a lot of really interesting use cases out there around things like anomaly detection and fraud detection, looking for outliers. Um, there's been a fair amount of work on leveraging graphs to build recommenders, uh, as well as do things like social network analysis or graph search like I've got here down at the bottom. Last but not least, doing things like access control where you're want to be able to update all of the ACLs, the access control list that a particular document has without having to go and update the individual documents. Uh, so you can see a few examples of, for instance, graph style search things that you can do in Solar. So for instance, find all tweets mentioning Solar by me or people I follow. And really that or people I follow is, is the induction of the graph there. Or find all draft blog posts about Parallel SQL written by Tim Potter, uh, so on and so forth. If you've used Facebook's graph search, this is what we're kind of talking about here, this ability to leverage those inferences, leverage those relationships as we interact with our data. So some of the graph basics, uh, not a lot to add here other than obviously as you think about your data, some things will just very naturally fit as a graph. Other things do not. Right? And so anytime you're dealing with edges and relationships and, and nodes, you're often thinking about graph. Traditionally, people when dealing with graph style data in solar have had to go get another engine, a graph engine, a purpose-built graph engine to be able to deal with that data. And so they would bring in like Neo4j or, or some other application that gave them that graph capability. But what they were often missing then was the ability to actually search the values and search the nodes, search the metadata associated with the relationships. And so then they were often bringing the data back out of the graph and, and trying to find a way to index it into solar. And this was often a, a complicated mess at the end of the day because representing that content naturally in an inverted index isn't always straightforward. Uh, but luckily, in Solar 6, the community added in a graph query parser. I'll show you a little bit on what that does here in a minute. And then coming in Solar 6.1, which isn't quite released yet, but uh, should be out fairly soon, we actually bring the graph capabilities into all of the streaming expression stuff that Tim was just talking about. So I want to cover that here as well, because that's uh, very, very interesting. It adds a lot of capabilities. So digging in, on the query parser side, this is a, a new capability that was added in 6.0. And really what it's designed to do is do a traversal of data that you've with defined relationships in the, uh, in the content, do a, a, a cyclic aware graph traversal and bring back rankings of those documents based on the relationships. And so as you can see in the diagram on the right here, you might have a graph structure where you've got, you know, nodes A through H, and then you've got relationships between them. As you're indexing your content, you're actually explicitly saying, you know, this is a, a this is my document and it has these in edges and these out edges. You're actually defining out those relationships ahead of time. And what the graph query parser then allows you to do is traverse those relationships as we're doing the scoring. Uh, the, one of the best use cases for this is often the ability to update access control lists as you, uh, independently from your core content. So you might imagine that uh, A is your main document and then C is your, one of your access control lists and you can update that independently or you might update the relationships independently. Uh, one of the limitations to the graph query parser, though, unfortunately, as of right now, anyways, is it only works on a single node or if you're in solar cloud mode on one shard. Uh, now, that being said, you can often fit a lot of graph style relationships 
in a single node. This is, in fact, how most graph engines like Neo4j, et cetera, scale anyways, is they just scale vertically because the nature of graph data is often very compressible, and so you can fit lots and lots of documents into, the, uh, into a single instance. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the graph query parser because, frankly, I like the, uh, and I think the streaming expressions capability is a lot more expansive, but I at least want to make people aware of the query parser. I've thrown in a few examples down here. These are pretty much straight out of the documentation. So you can see, for instance, exam the, the first one here is pretty straightforward. I'm doing a query that uh, gets IDA, so that top, uh, that top node in the graph. And then I'm telling the solar via the local params, uh, this using the graph query parser, that I want to go from my in edges. This is actually a field on the documents that I, I've defined. And I want to traverse through to the out edges. And what the query parser will then do is go build an, uh, a graph representation behind the scenes from that, which it then traverses and scores on. Um, some of the other interesting things that you can do with this, the second example is you can actually provide filters for traversal so that you can limit the, uh, which nodes are returned. Uh, you can control things like the depth. You can control whether you want to include roots and or leaves, uh, so on and so forth. I also know there are some other improvements coming in this. Uh, if you go look in Solar's issue tracker, there's some more details on uh, some of the capabilities here. So that's the graph query parser. Um, as, uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, one of the things I think that's pretty powerful coming in 6.1 is the ability to do uh, these graph streaming expressions. Tim mentioned this already, this notion of gather nodes. I'll show you what that looks like here in a minute. Um, some of the things that are quite uh, powerful here, though, is that uh, as of now, uh, this on trunk or in 6.1, uh, the, the graph streaming expressions implement a very powerful breadth-first traversal of all of the content that matches, uh, matches the request for the streaming. Uh, and there's a couple of other interesting things here as well. One, this works across shards. So this is full distributed mode. It takes advantage of that whole worker data tier that Tim was talking about earlier. And interestingly enough, you can actually go across collections as well. Uh, and so you can do essentially large graph style joins between shards, uh, between very large scale shards and across collections. Uh, this also supports, uh, the, the graph streaming also supports aggregations and other streaming expressions. So you can build out compositions of streaming expressions. I've got a, a few examples of those as we go throughout here. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, as any good graph engine, uh, a requirement of any good graph engine, you have to be cycle aware. Uh, and so this has the ability to detect cycles so you don't end up uh, in an infinite loop when you're doing these calculations. At the bottom of the screen, I've got an example of uh, what a curl request might look like. Uh, similar to what Tim was describing with the the slash SQL uh, endpoint for streaming, we have the slash stream one, and you can just provide as your expression the graph capabilities or the, the graph expression. So let's take a little bit of a look at what some of those expressions look like. Tim mentioned the movie lens data set, so I thought I would leverage those here as well. Uh, and so here's a very simple graph expression that's just saying, gather nodes on the movie lens data set and basically i'm walking uh which is you know people who work on graphs it's a very familiar term that you walk the graph i'm walking from user id 389 whoever that user is this is an anonymous data set and i'm gathering up all of the movie ids that that user watched so movie id here is another field on the document and so behind the scenes uh, solar in the streaming capabilities is doing a breadth first traversal and finding all of those uh, relationships back to that user ID. Uh, I did say here that this is a breadth first traversal. There's also uh, some capabilities around shortest path and other types of traversals. We'll talk a little bit about those more as we go here. Going a little bit deeper on this, what if you wanted to ask the question, find me all of the movies 
that viewers of a certain movie watch. And so now you can start to see I'm expanding out from my graph. Frankly, that last gather nodes that we did was pretty basic. You could probably do that with a straight up, uh, or not even probably, you can do that with a straight up solar query. This one is a little bit more interesting though. I've, I've put in bold a few key things here. Uh, first, you can see that I'm actually embedding multiple or I'm nesting gather nodes. So that inner gather nodes is taking that movie ID, in this case, uh, movie ID 161, which uh, for fans of the air up there, that's the, the movie lens uh, reference to that one. Uh, and then I'm gathering all of the users who watched or rated that, I shouldn't say watch, who rated that movie. And then from that, uh, you can see the outer gather nodes actually is doing another walk, but this time it starts with this magic word called node, and it's walking from the node. So it's walking from the nodes provided by that inner gather node and walking out from the users there to the uh, back out to all of the movie IDs. And then this track traversal is basically a way of saying, I want to see all of, the, uh, all of the data associated with that as we go here. Uh, and so this, uh, so this expression then lets me see all of the relationships between the users and movies starting with that anchoring movie. Uh, and I'll uh, be sure to follow up. I just realized that I should have posted what this data looks like on output here, so I'll follow that up with uh, in a blog post here or a tweet just so everybody who's on this can see what the resulting data looks like. Last but not least, as another example, and this one gets a lot more complex. If you've heard of uh, building out recommenders on solar, or perhaps you've, built, uh, you've heard of Mahout's collaborative filtering capabilities, uh, it's essentially the ability to say people who bought this item also bought this other item. Well, you can model that as a graph as well. Uh, and so what I've done here is taken an example uh, I've taken an example off the documentation and modified it for the movie lens data. And so this is a much more complex example, so I'll walk you through a little bit. Um, the idea here is that we've got some user who's starting off. We want to recommend movies to this user. So in this case, where you see that search uh, streaming expression, user ID 305, that's our, that's our anchoring user. We're going off and getting all of the uh, movies for that user. And then from there, we're walking out via the gather nodes to other movies and other users. Uh, and then kind of working our way out into the neighborhood around this user and the movies that they've watched. And then finally, at the end of the, at the top here, we're asking for the top five of these. And so you have the ability to build out a very quick and easy collaborative filtering example. And so if you think, for instance, if you put all of your user interactions, all of your transactions that users are doing with your site into solar itself, uh, this is what we call signals and fusion, you can then very quickly and easily build out collaborative filtering style uh, applications on top of that. There are other ways to do this as well, but the nice thing that I like about this example is that it's very quick and easy to see whether this style of approach and, and with your data is going to be effective or not. And again, I'll dump out the results of this online here. Frankly, they're too large to even show on the screen here, so uh, I'll, I'll show an example later as we go. So that's a couple of examples. Um, now I thought it would be good to jump in on a few comparisons, both for the SQL streaming expressions capability as well as the graph. So I'm going to hand it back to Tim, and he's going to cover the SQL side, and then I'll wrap up with the, the graph side, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, where all this stuff is headed. Sure. Thanks, Grant. Uh, yeah, so, you know, obviously solar is search first, but, you know, uh, for me, when I'm evaluating these systems, you know, what's the secret sauce? And, you know, for solar, one of the things I think is, is actually, uh, it has an advantage of is the ability to execute very complex queries. Uh, we, can, we can have a whole webinar on that, but, you know, full text, spatial, all the functions that have come over, you know, been developed over time. 
distributed pivot, uh, pivot facets are very much like OLAP cubes, all that type of stuff. Yeah, you know, the, the SQL is built on top of that. Uh, if we look at something like Hive, you know, obviously it's a pretty mature SQL solution built on, on, uh, on the Hadoop stack. Uh, but for doing kind of complex, you know, full text searches, it's just not, you know, on par with solar. Um, and then, you know, the, the other one that probably is, is very hot technology right now is Spark SQL. <clears throat> and its secret sauce really is, you know, the shuffle and its kind of distributed computation engine, uh, without a doubt, is, is sophisticated and, and very impressive. Uh, you know, and then also with Spark SQL, you get a lot of integration with other technologies like machine learning and whatnot. Um, and, the, and the nice thing is, is that, and I think I alluded to this, how we use this in Fusion, is that actually uh, we work with Spark so that if you execute a query in Spark, it can push down the search predicates down into Solar SQL Engine because, again, that whole idea of pushing down into the engine is where you really get the scale and the speed and the low latency on these queries. Um, you know, it, it, we'll, we'll have another slide here in a second, but in terms of SQL features, Solar is very much still evolving. Uh, but for me, the streaming engine under the covers for doing joins and things like that is actually really solid and come a long way uh, since Solar 5. And so, yes, the SQL interface itself is evolving, but the core engine below it uh, is actually very solid and built on school, Solar scalability. Um, maybe another one I think that's kind of, uh, interesting to call out is sort of, you know, where all this integrates with other systems. Again, uh, I lead up a team that kind of manages the integration with Solar and Spark, and so that integration is actually quite good. Um, but Solar itself and the streaming and SQL, uh, you recall there is a stream source, uh, which um, is JDPC. So you can actually pull in results. Maybe it's a small table uh, into, you know, into Solar uh, using JDPC, but in terms of that, um, you know, it's, it's pretty limited as far as calling out to other systems other than JDBC. Yeah, Tim, and, and, and I would add, too, I mean, when I often think about this from the, the architectural level, uh, you know, one distributed, keeping one distributed system up and running and in sync and, and happy is a hard enough problem. And what you often find when you start to bring in more complex architectures is people say, oh, well, I want a NoSQL engine for this, I want my... Uh, Hadoop and HDFS for this, and I want solar for that. And uh, once I, once you often dig into their use cases, you often find that you can make simplifications. So, so at the end of the day, all else being equal, if I can have a single distributed engine that takes care of my main workloads, then I'm going to be a lot happier, or at least my DevOps team will be a lot happier. And so I try to go back to my first core principles of what kinds of questions do I need to answer most often, and then what is the simplest, easiest, most stable way that I can deliver those. And, you know, time and time again, I just keep coming back to that solar answers to that question. And then, you know, when we, we throw Spark on top of that, we're still backing Spark with the solar data store uh, and, and leveraging Spark then for those iterative jobs because it's often the case in search that, you know, I've got my real-time queries that are serving my users, and then I've got my offline compute that's essentially enhancing my understanding of what the users are doing with the data. And so Spark and Solar there to get together become a really nice choice. On the, the graph side, uh, similar kinds of things that we can lay out here. Obviously, there's a lot of choices out there. I picked a few popular ones. Um, when I think about where solar really shines uh, on the graph side, you know, the query parser stuff is really good at doing predefined relationships as filters. It's not a general purpose graph engine by any stretch. Uh, likewise, the streaming expressions uh, really, I think, is geared towards these kind of fast query-based distributed graph operations. And, and it's really about how can I focus in on a traversal of a neighborhood of a reasonable size across the, the graph engine. I'm not going to necessarily do iterative computation in solar when it comes to graph, uh, but I can do a lot of these really fast focused query-based graph operations that lead to answering interesting questions because, you know, things like what I just showed in the examples. If you look at some of these other engines out there, uh, Neo4j, 
uh, really geared towards graph operations, mainly focused on fitting on a single node, although I believe, and I'm not a Neo4j expert, you can scale out horizontally by effectively figuring out how to partition your graphs. Uh, Elastic, some people have uh, asked about Elastic Graph. Uh, when I look at the implementation there, and again, I'm not an expert, but it's really geared towards uh, exploring relationships between terms. You, you start off with a query and then you can use Lucene's core search ranking capabilities to find documents that have similar terms and relate back to those. Uh, something you can do in Solar as well, um, but with Elastic you have the, the Kibana overlay and that's really designed for that user back and forth uh, view of the world. Last but not least, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about Spark. Again, I would go back to, at the end of the day, what Spark is really good at and, and Spark's delivery of graph capabilities is through a library called GraphX. It's really geared towards these large-scale iterative graph operations, things like page rank, and strongly connected components, and, and all of these other things that perhaps you, knew, you learned at university around graph operations. So uh, second you know, row here, common graph algorithms. Uh, so these are things like what kinds of traversal mechanisms are supported by the graph engine, what kind of algorithms can you run on top of this. Some people might be familiar with Pragel style graph operations or, or BSP, bulk synchronous pro parallel processing. The ability to run those often is what lets you do much more advanced graph style operations. Uh, and be, let you be a lot more effective. A couple of other things to note on the scaling side, you know, I mentioned already some of the limitations around the query parser in solar. Uh, obviously the expression stuff building out on that SQL engine really lets you drive large scale. Um, things like Neo4j, for instance, as far as I could tell, most of the documentation there is geared towards replicating out a graph across nodes uh, and then obviously with Spark, you know, because that's built on top of the RDDs and the, uh, that back Spark, uh, those are very, very scalable. Um, second to last row I think is pretty interesting. If you look at some of the licensing requirements, uh, there are, uh, not all of these are open source of course, or some of them re require commercial extensions. Uh, and then last but not least, one of the interesting things I think about solar is because it has this very pluggable output architecture, uh, the people who implemented this said, hey, why don't we add graph ML support? Uh, there's a lot of graph visualization engines out there that allow you to ingest graph ML. Uh, a nice open source one here is called Gephi, and the cool thing about Gephi is it can take in that graph ML and then it, it can apply its own algorithms on top of that uh, graph ML output. So, and various other uh, uh, graph engines here have their own set of choices as well. So obviously this is just scratching the surface. Uh, you, could, you could go a lot deeper doing benchmarks, doing uh, uh, feature before feature comparison, but we just wanted to kind of touch on some of the highlights as we see it. And so with that, let's dig in a little bit on future work. Tim? Sure. So, you know, kind of as I said, the, the, the actual implementation of SQL is evolving. Uh, we started out with the Presto SQL parser, um, and then uh, work is actually underway to migrate to Apache CalCite, uh, which is a much more robust and, and full-feature um, SQL parser, as well as cost-based optimizer. And again, that gets back into, you know, when do you push things down into the engine uh, for evaluation and whatnot. So, um, at this point in time, as I showed, the streaming engine under the covers supports joins, but the actual SQL interface does not, but is coming uh, probably around Solar 6.2, but don't quote me on that, but, you know, it's soon. Uh, in the meantime, you can use the, um, <clears throat> effectively, the streaming expression to do your joins. Um, but as we move to Apache CalCite, you'll get joins at the SQL layer. There are also sort of minor things like I showed the range syntax that'll be addressed, as well as kind of exposing all of the power of solar functions 
as where clause predicates and that type of thing. That's still a little bit evolving as well too. Um, but this is again, uh, like I said, uh, the engine itself is, is um, very, very solid and scalable as, you know, and then over the next couple releases of solar, we'll be rounding out the, in finishing up the actual feature, uh, the SQL implementation. Did we lose your grant? Oh, sorry, I uh, forgot to hit on mute. Um, on, the, on the graph side, uh, you know, because this is built on top of the streaming stuff, or at least the, the, the gather nodes capabilities and the like, is uh, gets to take advantage of any improvements around the, the core underlying streaming capabilities as well. So uh, should be some nice benefits uh, uh, in terms of performance as more people use this thing. Other things in terms of uh, the actual graph capabilities, adding in uh, different ways of doing traversals. So, for instance, uh, you know, I mentioned it's breath first. There's some shortest path capabilities in there already, adding things like depth first. Uh, for people who have used, for instance, uh, Apache Tinkerpop, uh, it has a, a graph query language called Gremlin that helps you define out traversals in the way that you're interacting with your graph. Uh, there's some discussion around adding support for Gremlin so that people then could go seamlessly between Tinkerpop and, and Solar. And then I think, you know, as the community decides, there's going to be a number of additional graph algorithms, things like page rank, support for looking at strongly connected components, other types of graph operations. And so, you know, at the end of the day, when I think about what's going on here, uh, you know, really enabling that next generation of, of analytics on top of search uh, is what all of this stuff is all about. And so I'm pretty excited about where Solar 6 is leading uh, and what we can do with it already. So with that, we've got, I think, uh, a couple of minutes for collect uh, questions. Uh, I've left a, a few links up here for people who are interested in learning more about uh, Fusion uh, and, of course, about all of this stuff, the webinar. Uh, is being recorded and will be made available for those who want to listen offline as well. Else, uh, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter or via the uh, uh, contact me on the Lucid Works website. With that, I'll hand it back to Leah. I'm sure she's got a few questions queued up, and uh, Tim and I will do our best to answer them. Thanks, Grant and Tim. So we do have some questions. Um, Again, if we don't get to your question today, someone from the LucidWorks team will reach out to you, but we have time for just a few. So the first question is, are there any special schema requirements to support the solar graph features? Yeah, that's a great question. So on the, the query parser side, you do need to have uh, essentially the, the in and out edges. They don't have to specifically be called those kinds of things. Uh, but you do need to have uh, fields on your documents that define the relationships between documents. So as you saw in my example back there, we explicitly had fields called in and out uh, edges. Um, you can also just, just declare the in edges. Um, I'd have to double check, but I think, uh, you know, as long as they all line up in terms of their they're matching, uh, you're fine. So I'm, I'm going to guess that there either need to be not numeric fields uh, or string types, not text analyzed fields. And then on the, the streaming side there, there's a lot more flexibility around, uh, around how the, the graphs are induced, if you will. Um, I can, uh, we can give out a, a, some documentation on this, but uh, suffice it to say, there's a lot of flexibility. For instance, the collaborative filtering example that I give, gave, that was actually using the row uh, as the definition of the relationship. So it was taking user ID and movie ID, those are the two nodes, and then the fact that that pair existed in a document then defines the relationship between the two. So you could say it's kind of inferring the relationship based on the entry. And so the documentation has all the details on, uh, on setting those up and what kinds of uh, field types and all of that can be uh, used. 
Thank you. The next question is, does the SolarJ API support Solar SQL statements? Sure, I'll handle that. So um, it, it, there's a package called SolarJ.io, which handles all of the uh, streaming expressions and, and access to the streaming engine. Uh, as far as the SQL goes, though, um, there is a JDBC driver that is now provided with Solar. Um, and I know people have asked about like OWC, so you can use like the JDBC OWC bridge. Um, if you want to actually interact, send SQL queries to Solar through SolarJ, uh, you can just do that because there's also the HTTP interface of the SQL endpoint. So it'd be a matter of essentially sending the parameter, which is called statement. And I think I had an example of that in one of the slides, um, but the documentation on this is actually quite good. You can essentially uh, post in your SQL over HTTP using SolarJ as well, but there's no, you know, like um, built into SolarJ because you can actually just use the Java, uh, Java X SQL, JD, you know, the basically the, the Java JDBC bindings built into Java to talk to Solar. Uh, so you really don't need it in SolarJ, so to speak. Thanks. So we'll just do one more question since we're, we're um, past time at this point. Do the Banana UI widgets support the new Solar 6 query features? Example SQL. Uh, not at this time. I, I don't know what the plans are actually to speak to that, but I think we can have somebody follow up on that around Banana. But right now Banana speaks Solar queries. Um, there's probably ways to, to, to you know, get that integrated, but I don't think right now there's any SQL interface for Banana or you know, the streaming API or anything like that. Well, and, that, and that's one of the nice things about the, the SQL endpoint is all of the tooling that does support JDBC. Uh, can be leveraged as well. So uh, right. you know, exactly, people, like you people can, have you those can available. Your, you can use your BI tool of choice that speaks JDBC and, and go to town with Solar now. So yeah, very good point, Grant. Thanks. Thank you. So we are out of time. Everyone who registered for this webinar will receive an email in the next few days with a link to the recording as well as the webinar slides. Um, if we didn't have time to answer your question today. Again, someone from the LucidWorks team will reach out to you. And if you have any additional questions, you can email us at events at lucidworks.com. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Grant and Tim, and we hope you have a great day. Thanks, Aaliyah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.